I'd like to look this morning at Genesis 26, and I'm going to read a text, verse 12. This is Isaac's, we might say, heaven-sent harvest. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Now when we think, children, of the names of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, perhaps over their names in our mind's eye we can put one word. We think of Abraham, we would have to put the word faith because he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He trusted God. We think of how he took Isaac even and he would offer his son. He trusted God. Faith is written over him. He believed in the God of impossibilities. You think of Jacob we would put over his name wrestling. He wrestled with God. He wrestled with the angel. And his life also was a struggle. Things didn't go easy for Jacob. Over Joseph's name, what would the word be? But providence. God provides. Jacob, he wrestled, but Joseph went down to Egypt, didn't he? And he had to go through all of the suffering of being imprisoned in Egypt. And yet through it all, God provided not only for him, but also for all of the children of Israel. Now over Isaac's life, we must write the word promise. God gave Isaac many promises but the first thing that we notice he was also the son of promise you remember of course that in Genesis 17 God made a promise to Abraham I will establish my covenant with Isaac and this is really important for us to understand of course Isaac was born out of a promise. Do you remember how Abraham's wife, Sarah, she couldn't have a son? And she, she was very, very old, wasn't she? And, and so was Abraham when Isaac was born. He was the son of promise. But God would also give promises as it were, upon the head of Isaac and upon the life of Isaac that are so important for us to understand. And God swore by himself. That means he could not lie. The promises that he gave could not be taken back. God would not speak an untruth. When he could swear by no greater, we read in the New Testament, he swore by himself, in Isaac he would establish his covenant. In other words, what it means is this. God was going to do a special work in the family of Isaac and in the following generations. They were going to be a special people, separated unto God from all the heathen nations of the world. And so these incredibly important promises would all be fulfilled through Isaac's line. Abraham had another son, Ishmael. But none of these promises would apply to him. And so this is the first thing that we learn. Isaac was the son of promise. And from Sarah's barren womb, he would come forth. God would give a promise of a son. And then in him all the promises would follow and would be fulfilled. Now what has this to do with us this morning? 
Well, in the New Testament, we're told that Christian people, if we've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are children of promise. And that's what we read there in Galatians 4. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. We have been given exceeding great promises from our God. Just as Isaac was born in a supernatural way, so Christian people are called out of the world to live for God. And God gives to them great promises of a new heavens, a new earth, sins forgiven, a saviour who shed his blood on the cross for them. How did this happen that they were called out? The New Testament tells us we're born again. And then on us who believe in Christ, promises rest, exceeding great and precious promises. You think of one of the promises that God will adopt us into his family. We become part of the children of God. We, we read on a, on a map different names of nations, but in God's mind, there are just those who are in his kingdom and those who are outside of his kingdom. And I wonder what side of the divide we're on this morning. But those of us who've trusted in Christ, we've entered into the kingdom of light and of the kingdom of God. And so we are beneficiaries of that kingdom, of its blessings but also we're adopted into the family of God. And when somebody adopts a child, they make, as parents, great and solemn promises. And this is what the Lord was doing with Isaac and does with all his people. He brings us into his family. Why? For his glory. Not for our glory, but for his and God does everything, not for the glory of the individuals like Isaac, but for, our, but for his own glory. For mine own sake, he says in Isaiah 48, will I do it. I will not give my glory to another. So the believer's hope of heaven rests upon this foundation. God has promised salvation. He's promised forgiveness. He's promised new life. He's promised eternal life in Christ. It cannot be destroyed, that promise. And so though we go through many times of fear and failure and trial, and at times we stumble when we look at the promises, then we can take hope. Are you a stranger to the promise this morning? In 2 Corinthians, we read that all the promises of God are yea and amen in Jesus Christ. In other words, they center on him. And if we are in him, then those promises are also on us. So we see, first of all, Isaac was a son of promises. But come down into verse 1 here. And the second thing we notice is that this is the land of the promises in which Isaac was living. And we notice here it says there was famine in the land. Now Isaac, we're told in the previous chapter in verse 11, he was dwelling by a well in the south of the land, a desert area, quite arid. And this well had a name, Lahayroi. It means the living one sees. And so Isaac lived by that well. He had his flocks. It was a very harsh environment. They had to go hunting, but they also had flocks and herds in that area. But we notice that there was a famine in the land. And perhaps Isaac thought to himself, well, this is the land that God has promised to give to my father and to me. And now, what shall I do? 
And it's interesting what he did. He travels 70 miles or so, 50 to 70 miles, and he comes unto Gira, it tells us there. And so he went west toward the coast where it was more fertile. But notice in verse uh, 12, Isaac sowed in that land. Now this is important because he was at Leheroi, but now he'd gone to Gira. But it was still within the land of promise. The most important thing we have to understand here, he did not leave the land in which God had promised to bless him. And his father, Abraham, he had gone down to Egypt at a time of famine. But Isaac, he was more cautious, more careful, more prayerful, perhaps we might say. This was a test of his faith. What would he do? Would he just say, well, I'll go down to Egypt. I know there's plenty of water there. But no, we find that he comes to Gira. And maybe today we're faced with various trials and tests. Perhaps we are faced with a similar test to what our parents were t- faced with. And we say, well, I'll just do what they did. Or I'll just copy my friend. He's been through this particular trial uh, and difficulty. And yet, friends, how do we think? Isaac, you see, he was very cautious. Some commentators think that he was on his way to Egypt, but the Lord then spoke to him and stopped him going. And I think we have to be careful. Isaac was a very contemplative man. He thought about things. He meditated upon the ways of the Lord. And he knew the promise that this was the land in which he must remain. Well, he was no doubt afraid to go to a Philistine. In fact, we detect later that because he lied about his wife, Rebecca, uh, saying that she was his sister, it shows us he was afraid of the king. He was afraid to live among, effectively, godless people. But you see how Isaac, he wanted to remain under God's promise. And we can be tempted at times. We can say, well, I'm not going to trust in the Lord. The last time a trial came, uh, yes, I tried to pray. I tried to commit it to the Lord. I tried to lean upon the Lord. But it seems that Another trial has come in quick succession. And now I'm almost so exhausted, I'll just give up. And I'll just let things, as it were, take their own course. We need to be careful, don't we? So often, when trials come, our old nature is stirred up. And we say, well, we'll go our own way. We'll do our own thing this time. Do we overreact? When pressure comes upon us and we say, is has the Lord forgotten me? Can he really mean that I have to go through this particular pathway? You see, Isaac, all around him, perhaps his own family was saying to him, let's go down to Egypt. It's the obvious solution. Believers can come under pressure. And so we must not forget the promises of God to his people. You think of Elimelech in the book of Ruth. He took his decision in his own hands, didn't he? He said, I'm leaving Bethlehem, the house of bread, and I'll go down to Moab. But he went out and he never returned. He left the house of bread, which was under the promise of God. Oh, how careful we need to be even when material needs press hard upon us. You see, the believer must seek to remain 
under the promises of God. Trust his timing. Trust his care and his provision. So we have the land of the promises. But then thirdly, we notice the confirmation of these promises in verse 2. This, of course, anxious time for, for Isaac, but then this remarkable appearance of the Lord. We call them in the Bible theophanies. God being revealed. And here it appears as though this was a, uh, a real, not a, just a vision, but an actual appearance of the Lord to Isaac. The Lord appeared unto him and said, go not down into Egypt. And then we have these remarkable promises. Maybe at times we get perplexed and confused. And we say, well, the Lord doesn't see me. He's forgotten me. See, Isaac could have easily thought like that. But how gracious is the Lord. Sometimes the Lord will bring a word of, uh, of the Bible to our memory in times when we are fainting. And he will apply, as it were, by the Spirit to our hearts a word which will be an encouragement to us. But here he comes to Isaac. And it reminds us that God is where his people are at all times. You think of those that were cast into the furnace uh, in the book of Daniel. The, free, the three friends cast into that fiery furnace. But there was one that appeared like unto the Son of Man in the midst. The Lord was with them. And that's so often the case in the word of God. When the people of God are in a storm or in a trial, the Lord is there with his tried people to reassure, to comfort, and to strengthen them. Well, he comes to Girar here, and the word literally means a lodging place. And the Lord says to him, sojourn in this, in this land, in verse 3. Stay here, lodge here. You're under the promise of my protection and my care. And we can see here the great promises that were given. Some think there are five, others seven. But we look at them quickly in verse uh, three. I will be with thee. Rely upon me. Not upon Egypt, not upon even Abimelech, but trust in me. We think of that great promise to all the people of God. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. This has been the echo throughout the whole word of God. God will not leave his people. I will be with thee and not forsake thee. In the New Testament, of course, we have the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. What an amazing name. What an amazing thought. I will be with thee. I will bless thee. I will bring peace and prosperity and protection to you, Isaac. I will be ready to defend you. And in Ephesians, we read, believers are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ from heavenly places. I will bless thee. It means I will make you contented, peaceful, happy. I have my I to your happiness. And is that not the case? The Lord has our ultimate good. All things work together for good to them that love God. Do we believe that? Unto thee, he says, and unto thy seed. Notice how he impresses upon Isaac here that this land of Canaan has a part in the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises for all the nations of the earth. Unto thee, unto thy seed. And ultimately there is a hint here of the heavenly inheritance 
For a believer, you see, the, the land of Israel, that is not our inheritance. We have a heavenly world, a new Jerusalem. That is our inheritance. That's the land to which we look. Unto thee and unto thy seed. And so he says here, I will give these countries, these lands, literally. But that was not ultimately the promise. But then he says, I will make thy seed to multiply. Here he's talking about the large family, not only that Isaac would, would have through his descendants, but how that that family of God would ultimately be gathered in from people of all nations. And so here we see the great promise, eventually, that the church of Jesus Christ would go through all the nations of the earth, people from every tribe, every tongue, every kindred, every language represented in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The whole earth blessed. The gospel, you see, is here pictured. The coming blessings of God. And then, of course, in verse 6, uh, sorry, verse 5, it says, Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge. He reminds us of the the oath, the unshakable faithfulness of God. Uh, he cannot change his mind. His promises will never fail, but he will fulfill his salvation uh, because Abraham obeyed. The blessing is going to be tied back to the obedience of Abraham. And yet it will be by God's grace. And so these are the promises confirmed to Isaac by the Lord appearing to him. And we see there in verse 6, Isaac's response. He dwelt in the land. But then we move on, fourthly, to the test of the promises. And from verse 7 to 11, we have this sad tale of Isaac lying about Rebekah, his wife. And yet the question is this, how were the Lord's promises proved during this time? We can focus upon <coughs> Isaac's sin. Lying, of course, was not, not right, was it? It's not right to lie. Of course not. No matter what the circumstances. But notice not the lying, but the protection of God over Isaac and his family. And this was the beginning, you see, of the promise of God being fulfilled in him and in his family. God had promised, I will be with thee. I will protect thee. And so he did, despite the sinful way that Isaac slipped into. And so that's an encouragement to us on the one hand, isn't it? Perhaps today we look back and we say, an old sin has risen up in my life. I can't seem to put it down. I deeply grieve over it and mourn over it. I repent of it. I pray about it. But nonetheless, the consequences then we can commit them to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't know how this sin, as it were, can be covered. But look at the promise of God to Isaac. He protected him. He protected Rebekah. And so fulfilled his promise. And so this is an encouragement to us. We're so weak, aren't we? We think of Moses got angry. We think of Elijah sometimes, he, he, he was despairing. We think of Jonah, he disobeyed. We think of Peter, he denied his Lord. We think of Thomas, who doubted. 
you could look at all of God's people. You could say, well, look at that sin. But the Lord, it's his name, you see, that was at stake. And so he protected Isaac. Now, we need to be careful, of course, not to think we can just sin and that the Lord will somehow uh, overrule in our life. But we need to be, remember, if we're under the promises of God, to walk humbly, prayerfully, and repent of those sins that so easily beset us. But we must look lastly this morning and briefly uh, at this harvest of blessing. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. You see, he was surrounded by her, a harassing world. He'd got the Philistines around him. They were looking on at him. They were watching his every move. And the world watches the Christian. But in the midst of it, in the land in which he didn't really want to be, in Gerar, he sowed. And so, you see, we have to understand, firstly, it was obedience to God. That's why he received this blessing, because he obeyed the Lord. The world would look on and say, what's the point of sowing in Gerar? It will soon come under the same drought as what was at uh, Leheroi. What's the point of it? Ah, by faith, Isaac sowed in that land. They, perhaps you can imagine at least Enoch knocking on his door one day and saying, Dad, what is the point of what you're doing? Sorry, Esau, he would have said, Go to Egypt. He sold his birthright, didn't he, in the previous chapter for a bowl of soup. He didn't see any purpose in the land or any purpose in the promise of God. But Isaac sowed. And so God's children, you see, we may have family members around us. They say, what's the point of living for the Lord? What's the point of serving him? What's the point of obeying him? What's the point of believing in all these promises of God? It's by faith. In obedience to God, he sowed. And he sowed based upon the promises of God. Faith, you see, is hope in the things which cannot be seen. And Isaac expected great things from God as he sowed that crop. What of us this morning? What are we, what are we sowing? Are we saying, well, what is the point in this world? Jesus had to remonstrate sometimes with his disciples. Oh, ye of little faith. You don't see the point in serving me. You don't see the point in seeking the Lord. You don't see the point in turning from sin. Fleeing to Christ. All the joys and blessings of knowing him. You have no faith. Isaac sowed in faith. You think of that man that came to the Lord and he had to say, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. He was very honest, wasn't he? We need to pray, Lord, increase my faith. Help me to, to sow in the hard times when there are just discouragements all around, when nobody is there. To speak a word to lift me up. But then it was a sign also of his diligence. It wasn't easy. Here he was in a strange land. He had to prepare the soil. He had to labor night and day perhaps to plant this crop all around him. Uh, foreign uh, uh, people. He could be attacked. His crop could be destroyed. There could be a drought and he could be mocked. But no, he sowed. He trusted in the providence of God. The Lord, it says, 
blessed him. It wasn't the land that brought forth plentifully. It was the blessing of God upon his faith that caused him to prosper in Girar, in a strange place. We read in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Whatever we do for the Lord, we have to do in faith. We don't do it because there are favourable conditions. We don't do it because the sky is blue. We do it because God has promised for his own glory to bless his word and to strengthen his people and to gather in a nation for himself from all the tribes of the people of the earth. That is why we witness. And it was a witness, you see, this abundant crop which uh, Isaac gathered in that year was a witness to all of those people around that God was with him, that God had blessed him. And that's exactly what we see there in verse 28. We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. The Lord blessed you. We've never been able to get a hundredfold yield from this land. Something's going on beyond earthly power. Oh, how wonderful it is to think that in all our weakness as we labor to serve the Lord, it is not in our power to give the increase. But when the increase comes, we know where to put the crown upon, upon whose head. A hundredfold. And this finally brings us to the words of Christ. He said, he who takes his cross and follows me, he shall perhaps lose father and mother and brothers and sisters, but he shall receive a hundredfold mothers and brothers and fathers and sisters and houses. In other words, he's speaking of what the wonderful reality of being a child of God is, that you be, enter into a family that are all under the promise of God and in the world to come eternal life that's the promise of Christ to his people so this morning let us take heart in seasons of need in seasons of perplexing circumstances around us in seasons where we feel like we're completely out of our depth how can the Lord bless us here how can the Lord help me in this situation let us be like Isaac Remember the promise of God and so that one day we may reap an abundant harvest by his grace. See, when the believer's strength is frail, the Lord himself becomes their storehouse. He pours out his blessings upon them as he did for Isaac, so he can do for us. And they are all found in Christ Jesus, in the grace of God that is revealed in the Saviour. He who said, I am the bread of life, I am the water of life. He can provide abundantly all that we need beyond all that we can ask or think. Isaac sowed in that land. And received in the same year an hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And may the Lord bless us also for his glory. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 528.